Well, thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be with all of you today, and I probably have the advantage that I haven't sat in lots of these lengthy international meetings and conferences, and I admire them, and I value them, and I think that the efforts before us in trying to bring the world together around the challenges of meeting energy needs, providing energy access to the poorest among us, and now addressing climate change is an additional and incredibly important challenge, warrant bringing people together. So I say special thanks to Dr. O, to you who have brought the World Economic Forum here, to all of you gather for these kinds of meetings. I haven't done a lot of that in the past. I looked over the agenda, talked with a few of you about what had been presented here yesterday. I wasn't able to be here and tried to find the subjects that, based on my experience and my own sense of priorities, ought to be addressed here today, and subjects that hopefully revolve relatively little redundancy in terms of what you've heard. You're an informed audience. I don't want to insult anybody by covering ground that's been well covered previously. And then finally, I thought the most important thing from my point of view would be to focus on what might be done as a highest priority matter to achieve these so-called integrated solutions, the topic of our panel, by taking practical and large and large-scale steps that make a difference over the next decade. Like many of you, I'm a little skeptical of goals and standards and plans that have a multi-decade reach. I think we should have goals down the road, but the question many of you raised is how do we get this done? And I will draw, of course, on my own experience, which has been much more on the practical side of getting things done than it has been on the development side uh, of international planning. I say that's incredibly important. I personally, like so many of you, believe that the Copenhagen negotiations will be incredible, like what I trust as many of you, and not all of you by any stretch are U.S. citizens, but I regard it as incredibly important that the United States come forth in this year with federal climate change legislation as a foundation for moving ahead. I think we in the U.S. have an obligation to assist in significant ways in providing leadership in this community of nations that you represent in addressing energy and climate change. So what, what will I address today? I've tried to limit it. I've tried to be quite focused. I'm going to address three subjects. If time runs out, I'll even drop the third subject, so I'm taking them in what I believe is successive order of importance and my ability to contribute to them. So the first subject will be energy efficiency. Others on the panel will likewise talk to that. What I'm going to try to address with respect to energy efficiency is a means that I believe is a powerful one, not the only one, but a powerful one for getting it done. So that's number one. Number two, I'm going to address the incredible importance of addressing now and over the next decade, not further into the future, but now, preservation of tropical forests and soils from the threats they face and the loss, losses that are occurring there at such a rapid rate. And so I emphasize addressing that with respect to what can and should be done in the next decade. And then specifically, what do I want to talk about a little there that seems to me have, to have been not much remarked upon is the opportunity for financing. So in the Copenhagen negotiations, all of you know, Financing issues will, to a degree, dominate a lot of the discussion, and rightly so. This is a massive undertaking. I want to talk about the role of international offsets, challenging and important subjects. So I'll address that. And then third, if time allows, and I'll try to be conscious of the fact that we're starting behind schedule here, I'll address tra electric transportation. I think that has an enormously important role to play in creating alternative energy fuels with very substantially lower both economic costs 
and environmental costs for the future, and I believe lots can and should be done in the decade that now follows. But I, if I don't get to that, we'll see whether questions can follow there. So let me start then with, with energy efficiency, and I'm not going to go into very much the foundation for talking about energy efficiency. I trust everyone knows in this audience that the reality is that energy efficiency is fundamentally in many, many forms, many, many steps that can be taken, a least cost path to meeting energy needs. And you also know that it can be put in place quickly and with no adverse environmental impacts whatsoever. So the reality is around the globe, notwithstanding some great initiatives. I mean, Japan has set a very high standard. Very pleased to see China making the commitments now that it's making with respect to near-term ambitious energy efficiency improvement goals. But it nonetheless remains true around the world, substantially everywhere, that we use energy wastefully. And that has economic costs, that it interferes with, to a degree, global prosperity. And now, of course, we know it has enormous adverse impacts on the environment. Very high percentage of energy produced in the world, 70 to 80 percent, is in one way or another carbon-based, reducing climate change challenges. We have to move to energy efficiency. So I'm going to talk about the models for doing that, and the one that I believe that I know best. So primarily, I'm going to talk from my own personal experience and suggest that that model has application widely around the world to make a difference. Before I do that, let me explain a little bit why I picked these three subjects, efficiency, forestry, potentially electric transportation, and would address the things that in some ways in my company we've done the most of. I'm not going to address renewable energy. I'm not going to address nuclear energy. I'm not going to address carbon capture and sequestration. Those things are incredibly important. Our company much leads the U.S. in renewables, for example, much leads the U.S. in solar energy, wind energy. We have the location in California. There's great support in the state of California for these things. But the reality is looking hard, looking at hard at the relative effects of taking renewable further, which is what I probably devote most of my time to, taking renewable further will not mean significant scale impacts yet in this first decade. Vitally important to do, but we can't take it to scale in this next decade. We should move it as far as we can. Southern California Edison, 16% of the kilowatt hours provided our customers today are renewable in the narrowest sense of renewable. That doesn't include, for example, major hydro. That number's been 17 and 18%. These things vary from year to year. But those costs are still high. We need, still need to do basic research to improve them. I work with quite a number of scientists who are working on yet better models, breakthrough models for lower cost. The same thing, by the way, is true with carbon capture and sequestration. Nuclear, nuclear has a role in the future as a zero carbon emission form of baseload power generation. But practically no nuclear plants, talking about scale, which is all important, will be built around the world in the next decade. China is a possible exception, but even there it'll be a relatively small part of the total Chinese production, practically none in the U.S., practically none in Western Europe. So the question is, what do we do in this first decade, this decade ahead now, and I think, as I say, it's efficiency in the others. 